Unfortunately, I cannot guarantee that. But I can promise you that the Word of God has answers to all of our issues, to all of our questions, even the ones we don't have the courage to ask. I begin, first of all, by thanking God for this opportunity. Um, we came here from Chicago in July of last year, and we started attending this church in August. We came in the first Sunday, Pastor Ken was preaching. I uh, loved his preaching, introduced myself, came uh, the following Sunday, introduced my family, came the Sunday afterwards, and since then we have not stopped coming. Um, I don't know that you know what you have as a church in Pastor Ken, but for me and my family, we know what we have here. So we, we, we continued coming because we feel a deep sense of acceptance. We feel we've been treated as family. Uh, and this is the place we call home. Um, we, we feel respected also because to me that is very important. Um, and so we feel that. Now I know some of you are going to struggle, okay, hearing me and understanding me. Uh, if this is going to be any encouragement to you, you are not alone. I also struggle hearing and understanding you. <laughs> okay? So be encouraged that you are not alone. Okay? Um, my dean at Biola University, Cook School of Intercultural Study, and his wife and another friend, uh, another student that we go to school together are uh, here worshiping with us, and I have requested uh, to have my dean, Dr. Galadima, to please come and pray as I go into the message. Thank you. Is this on? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the power of your word. We thank you because uh, your word is light. Mm. We ask for your son as he speaks this morning that uh, he would speak the very words of life Amen. to us. Uh, we pray for each of us. Mm -hmm. We thank you because uh, you desire to connect with us. Mm -hmm. Father, I don't know where we all are, but you know. Mm. Zach doesn't know where we are, but you know. Mm. So we pray that as he speaks, he will speak the very words of life mm -hmm. from you to us. And that our spirits will be quickened. That after we have heard, we will do what you require of us. Mm. Because we know therein lies life for us. Mm. So please minister to us because we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. Um, where I come from, when you come to church, you know that you are in church, that, that it's the Lord's day. And when you go out is when the pastor is done. Okay? <laughs> so, um, we... We still want to say a big thank you to Calvary. Um, we have a place we, we stay, uh, the Missions House. We have become unofficial, official missionaries of uh, Calvary Baptist Church. Thank you so very much. Uh, Mama Don, thank you. Thank you for your support to our pastor. Romans 8, I'll be reading verse 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. The problem of evil and suffering has been termed the most formidable of all atheistic objections to the Christian faith. That it is formidable does not mean that it is plausible. 
That it is formidable doesn't mean that all of the arguments that the atheist brings about the existence of God surrounding the problem of evil and suffering. Um, there is another account, and the account that we're going to be looking at is what does the Bible say about all of these? And I thank God that the foundational work had already been done. That is the Bible. One of the, the problems that I find is that we try to respond to the atheist's objections using human philosophy and all of the psychology and all of whatever is out there. But we have an authoritative word, which unfortunately the atheist also doesn't believe. But hey, we don't have anywhere to argue than first of all from the Bible. This is what it says. So the other arguments that have been put forward um, when, when our brother Steve did his beautiful work here, it was also situated in the Bible. Now, doesn't it interest you that God himself doesn't waste time trying to prove whether he exists or not? The Bible just says, in the beginning, God. So, the Bible doesn't begin by making an argument to prove that God exists. It is interesting when we, as human beings, try to prove that the one who created us exists, or we try to disprove uh, his existence. Why, why the problem of evil and suffering has been termed most formidable is because of the attacks it brings on the fundamental affirmations of the Christian faith. As people of faith, we believe that God exists, we believe that God is all-powerful, that God is all-knowing, that God is all-good and all-loving, and still, that evil exists. One Greek philosopher, ancient philosopher by the name Epicurus, puts the argument this way. God either wishes to take away evil and is unable, or he is able and unwilling, or he is neither willing nor able, or he is both able. Uh, willing and able. If he is willing and unable, he is important, which is not in accordance with the character of God. If he is able and unwilling, he is envious, which is actually at variance with God. If he is neither willing nor able, he is envious and feeble and therefore not God. If he is both willing and able, which alone is suitable for God, from what source then are evils? Or why does he not remove them? We ask questions when we are confronted with the reality of evil and suffering. Where is God? Or we ask, like Philippians say in his classic, where is God when it hurts? Is God on vacation? Has he become a sort of absentee landlord in the midst of our sufferings and all human predicament? Where is God? And sometimes we ask, like Bertrand Rosell, uh, why do bad things happen to good people? And in that kind of question, we already make assumptions about ourselves that we are truly good people, but bad things are just happening to us. So if God is all that Christians say he is, if he, is, if he exists and he is all-powerful, all-loving, and all-good, and all-knowing, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? Now we go back to the passage we have read, and we know that God causes everything. Wow. Years back, um, we, we were trying to build a house, and we, the, the plan came out, um, I don't like ground floor plans because they don't make any sense to me. The ground floor doesn't make sense. So evil and suffering do not frustrate the plan of God, according to Romans 8:28, where we just read, that everything in this life works according to God's master plan. Just like my frustration trying to understand what is the architect trying to do with all these drawings that weren't making sense. And the architect tells me, well, this is where the living room is going to be, this is going to be the bedroom, this is going to be the restroom, this is going to be this. And 
I am looking at it, and I said to him, this plan is too small. And he said to me, Pastor, just, just, just wait, just wait. It looked very small because I am not a trained architect. I don't understand the, tra- uh, the writings. They weren't making sense to me. And he insisted that he knows what he was doing. Well, what he knows he was doing, I didn't know. So, uh, I said, is there any way you can show me what this looks like? Well, we want a model to show that by the time everything goes up, this is what it's going to look like. God is a master planner. And everything that happens in our life, in this world, happens according to the grand design that you and I don't fully comprehend, and we wish that God could make us comprehend. And sometimes we tell God, God, if you just explain it to me, I'll be all right. Because in our world, we are trained to ask questions, why is this happening to me? And we ask God, why is there so much evil and suffering? Why is this happening to me? And I feel like God is saying, will you be ready for the answers? Because somebody asked God those kind of questions, Job. And God said, hey, brace up, and I'm going to talk to you like a man. Where were you? And God went through all of the where were you when I met the heavens and the earth, and all of it, and Job said, wow, God. I had a few from a distance, but now I have seen you face to face, and I repent in dust and ashes. Sometimes we don't understand what God is, but God, the God who causes everything, is a God who also even uh, makes everything for its purpose, even the wicked for a day of trouble. Do I understand fully what that means? Except to say that, you know, We keep thinking that we call the shots in this world. We keep thinking that this is our party. It's not. In this world that we live in, you and I don't call the shots. In this world that we live in, it's not our party. Let's stop making it about ourselves. Now, I understand that in our world we talk about self-esteem, self-sufficiency, and we have even gone to the place of selfie. So that almost everything is about self, 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 self. We lose it when we make everything about ourselves because it is ultimately not about ourselves. It's about about the God who has a plan. That God has a plan for your life. He has a plan for my life. He has a plan for the world that we live in. And I know that the atheists will find this very difficult, but wait. The atheist thinks that the God he is talking about is the same God we are talking about. Because as far as the atheist is concerned, the God that he envisions is a God whose existence precludes the existence of evil and suffering. But the God revealed in Scripture is a God who also uses even the existence of of evil and suffering to prove that he is God. So instead of using that argument to disprove the existence of God, we go to it and say, you know, there is indeed God who has a master plan. Now, in the passage, uh, the Apostle Paul says, we know. Now, we know is an intellectual assent to the propositional truths of the gospel as revealed in the scriptures. But we know is also an internalization of those propositional truths of the gospel. That we believe what the Bible says about evil and suffering. We believe what the Bible says about uh, God and His existence. And we believe why the universe is the way it is. And in the midst of that, we are not saying that it's just a mental thing, but that by the way we order our lives and by the way we live constantly, we reflect that what we believe is internalized in our lives. Again, does it take care of everything? Well, let's go back to verse 22 of the same Romans 8. In that passage, what we find there is that all creation groans. And why is creation groaning? Creation is groaning because something happened in Genesis 3. 
And the thing that happened in Genesis 3 is a complete departure from what you find in Genesis 1, verse 31, where after everything God said, that He saw everything He created was not only good, but very good. In Genesis, uh, uh, in Genesis 3, the fall came in. So I know we ask questions like, well, didn't God know that Adam and Eve were going to fall? Why didn't He prevent them from falling? If we are made in the divine image, as the Bible tells me and I believe, then we reflect the divine image. And God didn't make robots. He made human beings with a capacity to choose. And as they say, nobody chooses good unless there is a possibility of choosing evil. Nobody chooses right unless there is a possibility of choosing wrong. And when God placed them in the garden and gave them the options and said, hey, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the day you eat of it, you will die. Adam and Eve, I mean, Eve looked at the, at the tree and she saw the fruit and she said, it was good for wisdom. Ah, it was pleasurable to the eyes. And her husband ate, and they all ate. And I know someone sits here and says, well, if Adam and Eve had not done this, we wouldn't have been in this mess. I can almost guarantee that if, if I were in the garden uh, and, and I was the one giving all of those options, I want to try this one and say, why did God say we shouldn't eat it? Human beings will always want to stretch their boundaries and see what is going to be the consequences. We, as a result of creation groaning, we live in a fallen world, and we are fallen people, and we live fallen lives, and fallen things happen in a fallen world. And some of those things are what we call evil and suffering. The universe, as God created it, is not the way it is anymore. Order has been disordered. It's been disturbed, and the universe and things are no longer the way they are supposed to be. This is a serious claim that we make as Christians that is rooted in the Bible. And part of the consequences of living in a, in a natural world, in a fallen world, is that there is, we encounter natural evils such as earthquakes and floods and famines. They exist in a broken, fallen world. In a fallen world that we live in, we encounter moral evils such as rape, murder, we can talk about racism and injustice and all kinds of things that are going on in our world because we are living in a fallen, broken world. But we also live in a world of me metaphysical evil. We can talk about deformities and the rest. We live in a world of physical evil. We can talk about bodily pain and sickness and mental anguish and fear and death and grief. All because we live in a fallen world. Creation no longer um, uh, is the way God intended it to be, like I said, because it's been disordered. But all of creation also longs. There is a longing in creation, and that is why creation groans. There is a longing for when creation itself will be redeemed. So the Christian salvation is not just the salvation of human beings, but the salvation of all of creation. The universe longs for it. Uh, the universe longs for... And you guys, you guys are exploring other possibilities of living somewhere. So that when things go bad, you guys are going there and you're leaving us here. Okay? Is it here or there? You're leaving us there. Well, um, in the midst of these, now, let, let, me, let me do this. I love watching uh, detective movies. I, I love watching movies sitting, I mean, from the, you start watching it in your comfort until you begin to leave the seat, you come to the age, until you find yourself sitting on the floor just trying to figure out when will this guy be captured, the criminal. So when I read detective novels, when I used to have time to do that, and I follow the train, and the guys are just taking too long to catch the guy, you know what I do? I go to the end of the story. 
I go to the end of the story and I read and I know who the guy is and I know he's been caught. And so I come back and as I'm reading and the detectives are trying to figure out who is this guy, I already know. So I, I look at them and I say, these guys are fools. How wouldn't they know? I already know. Now, friends, even though the universe may be what it is, even though there is so much evil and suffering going on, it is not the end of the story. I have gone to the end of the book in Revelation, and in chapter 21, verse 1, and I hear what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. There is a greater plan that creation will be redeemed. The new heaven and the new earth will come. I know the end of the story. I don't understand the pieces and how they fit and how they're going to work towards the end, but I truly do know that there is a greater plan. The restoration of creation. <laughs> Evil and suffering do not invalidate the power of God. I think our understanding of divine omnipotence is that if God is truly all-powerful, then he must always use his power. It is, it is from the human understanding of what it means to be powerful. The powerful will always have their way. That is how we understand it. And so the atheist thinks that divine omnipotence is synonymous with arbitrary use of power. That God will use his power recklessly and at all times and anyhow and anywhere, whenever he chooses. But, but we forget that God's power is a power that he uses in a way that is consistent with his character and nature. Now back home we sing, there is nothing my God cannot do. And it seems to have a reference in Scripture when, Jer when the Lord said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 32, verse 27, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? And Jeremiah responded and said, Ah, Lord God, thou hast met the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Nothing is too difficult for you. We must not understand nothing is too difficult for you to mean God can and will do everything and just anything. God doesn't do that. For instance, when Jesus was tempted by Satan to turn the stone into bread, did he have the power to do that? Why didn't he? Oh, when they mocked him while he hung on the cross and they said to him, oh, he saved others but he can't save himself. If you're truly the son of God, come down from the cross. I said, you know what? I read that story in the Bible and I said, Jesus, you, you, you didn't impress me. Because if I were the one, I know myself and I know what I was going to do. If they mock me and, and they mock my divinity, they mock everything about me and they treat me like I am powerless, I know what I was going to do. I'll just come down from the cross and I'll walk. And let them know. Can you see? So what is your argument again? And then I'll go back to the cross. That is the way human beings think. We always think that there is something we need to prove. God doesn't have anything to prove. He, he doesn't. And so, even though he had the power to come down from the cross... It was going to defeat the purpose for which he came. Even though he had the power to turn bread, a stone into bread, he never did miracles for his own personal benefit. So to use power that way would be to use power against his purpose. Sometimes we think that God is less powerful when he doesn't heal as when he heals. Sometimes we think that God is less powerful and less loving and less knowing because he has chosen not to move our mountains. 
Our minds tell us that if God is all-loving and all-knowing, then He should prevent everything He knows that is going to be bad from happening. Our minds tell us that the power of God is in restoring physical well-being, and as such, when God doesn't restore our physical well-being, it's an indication that God is not as powerful as we have made Him to look. But instead of eradicating all pains and suffering and all of human hardships and difficulties, God does the unimaginable, the unthinkable, as far as humanity is concerned. God doesn't live in the abode in heaven, but He condescends by incarnating in the man Jesus Christ. He comes and steps into our suffering and feels with us what we are feeling. Now, theologians uh, in the patristic period of the church up until the 19th century kept talking about God as God who is impassable. He doesn't have feelings. He doesn't have emotions. God doesn't suffer. Uh, uh, In the 19th century, that theological position started changing. That God truly identifies with us. And I'm wondering, why didn't people see that before now? That a Christian God is a God who steps into our situation, steps into our sufferings, and feel with us what we are feeling. So when I'm asking why, 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 God says, I understand. How? Because He saw His Son suffer our suffering with our sins on the cross. So He is a God who identifies with us in the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. God steps into our suffering in the ongoing ministry of His Son, Jesus Christ, who, because He has suffered all these things, is able to sympathize with those who are suffering. I know that to the person who is suffering, other people's example of suffering doesn't make any sense to you. Uh, My mentor, the dean who just prayed, Told, uh, told me a story of somebody who uh, was in a difficult situation, and he was told about, I remember Job. And the guy said, honestly, what I am suffering is more than Job's. To the person who is suffering, I think also that, you, you know, Job's friends were okay until they opened their mouth. Maybe all they needed to do was to just sit quietly with him. Some people say, I know what you're passing through. Do you? But what do you know about what I'm passing through? Well, what do you know about someone who left his country and is in your country, and and his country is in a mess, and he is longing for the day when he will be able to go to his country, and his prayer every day is, I hope that when it's time for me to go back to my country, there will be a country for me to return to. What do you know? But what, what do we know about the reality of people's suffering? That you have lost your husband or you have lost your wife or you have lost a son or lost a daughter does not necessarily mean you know what I am passing through at the moment when I am in that situation because we are all different. Sometimes, can we just read Scripture and shut up? God is still the God who is all-powerful. And so we find the Spirit of God interceding on our own behalf with groans that are too hard for words. Creation is groaning, longing for her liberation from the curse of death and decay. And the Spirit is here groaning on our own behalf presenting our request to God, God comes into, He steps into our situation, and God empathizes with us in our situation. I hope that this encourages someone. Sometimes we feel because evil exists, then what it means is that evil and suffering have the final word. They don't. They, They don't. They are all walking towards the ultimate good of God's own children. And I don't understand what good it is to you 
in your own situation, but I know what it is in my own situation. God has a grand design. God remains all-powerful. So I remember the friends of Daniel. I remember I have Daniel and his friends and the, and, uh, and the lake of fire, and I remember uh, Nebuchadnezzar giving them an opportunity to renounce their faith or be thrown in, and I remember Daniel and his friends saying, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, we know that God is going to deliver us. But if he chooses not to be it made known to you today that we are not bowing down to your image. And Job says, though he slays me, I will trust in him. When you have prayed and the situation hasn't changed, can you still trust him? And we know evil and suffering do not negate the purpose of God. And we know that God, God causes everything to work. Everything, the good and the bad, everything to work. For the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And we know. We are not thinking. We are not wishing. We are not hoping. We are not imagining. We know. It's already settled. We know. I think that if the atheist has problems with, evil, with, with, with the whole existence of evil and suffering against everything that, God, that, that the Christian people say God is, I think also that the Christian faces the same difficulty, sometimes even greater because sometimes we feel that being children of God, God should provide immunity for us against all of these. That being saved means that we are the immune community. Nothing is going to happen to you. And there is another kind of preaching out there that seems to accelerate this kind of teaching. And we are told that if you are a child of God, you will never suffer. If you, are child, if you are a child of God, you will never lack. If you are God's own child, you will never be sick. One pastor back home in Nigeria died, and they refused to bury him. They said, Papa cannot die. It's not possible. Papa cannot die. And they kept him in the room and prayed and prayed and asked God to heal Papa, to bring Papa back to life. They got tired that Papa wasn't coming back to life. And Papa started disturbing them. You know how you disturb people when you are dead and they decide not to bury you and not to keep you in the morgue? You know how you disturb them? Yeah, Papa started disturbing them. And they couldn't, they couldn't live with a stench anymore. They had to take Papa where he belongs. God has a purpose. The events of life are not just chance occurrence. The events of life are not things that are just happening by accident. They all are working towards a divine purpose for the universe and for you and for me. God has a plan. He has the power and he is working towards his purpose. I know that as children of God, the Bible says in, in, uh, in verse 18 and 19 that we ourselves groan. So you find creation is groaning, the spirit is groaning, we are groaning. We groan because we already have the foretaste of what is to come. We groan because the Holy Spirit has already been deposited in us as a, as, as a promise guaranteeing what is to come. We groan for when our salvation will materialize completely. In, in that sense, I mean, we long for the consummation of our own salvation. We've already been saved. We are being saved, but we are awaiting when our salvation will be ultimate. We are longing for the day when this body of ours that suffers death and decay will be done with. So we groan under sickness. We groan as we age. And you, you guys, 
you guys are, you are you. So that when you begin to grow old, you bring some cream that you call that they are anti, or is it anti-aging cream <laughs> to keep you young forever. In the place where I come from, old age is a blessing. Ah, people celebrate old age. Ah! And you, you are running away from old age. <laughs> Hi. I have watched in my life pain. My elder brother, my younger sister, and another younger brother, three of them died in three months of sickle cell anemia. And yet my dad was a pastor who loved the Lord. And my mom, a very godly woman. And yet God took three of their children in three months. And sometimes you wonder and you ask God, God, is this how you show love to the people who love you? Don't you keep the people who love you and give them the best? Well, it is because I think that I know what is best more than God does. In three months. That last year, one of the communities in Jaws where we come from was attacked, and seven members of a family were killed in one night. And I asked God, God, what is the purpose of all of this? What good is coming out of this? My city has been on and off under attack since 1994. When a bomb goes up today in Jaws, tomorrow there will be more people in church than there was the, 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 the previous Sunday when the bomb went up. That is the situation under which people walk out their faith. It is in the midst of suffering and great evil. And the other day we were praying uh, and, uh, with a board, and, and I just couldn't pray. From the very time the other people started praying, I just saw my, I was in tears for the church in America. I was weeping. I was in tears. I just couldn't pray. And I was praying and asking God, God, don't let the church in America go through what we are going through before she comes to her senses. I have changed that prayer. Now I tell God, God, please just give them a little of what we're going through. Just give them. Perhaps, perhaps, and perhaps. As I try to, to close, hopefully, our present suffering, the Apostle Paul says in verse uh, 18, are nothing compared with the glory that will be revealed. It is momentary. Now, again, I, I don't want to, to, to diminish the pain and suffering that everybody goes through. Um, but I do know that sometimes when people are in pains and sufferings, we remind them that weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. But I also do know that to the person who is suffering, the night is longer than the usual night. But no matter how long it takes, and morning is going to break, there's going to be daybreak. And it's the good thing about the Christian story that evil and suffering will not have the final word. There is going to be that time when, when, when we are restored, when creation is restored, when the Spirit doesn't have any need to intercede with groans on our behalf. There is going to be that day when our salvation will be perfected, the reconciliation of all people. All things do not work together for good, but God works every, in everything for the good of those who love Him. 
All things do not work together for good for everyone. But God causes everything to work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. And therefore, the Apostle Paul could say in Romans 5, verse 3 to 7, And not only so, but with glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations work at patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope does not disappoint because of the love of God that has been shared abroad in our hearts. Suffering has made me humble. That's me. I don't know you. Suffering in America, America has dealt with me. Living in America has taught me humility. If you had seen me back home in Nigeria, in my office, with my driver riding me and I'm sitting behind. But now, I have learned to be humble. Suffering does something in the life of the believer. It is not a waste. It is to teach us to be humble. It is to teach us to die to all of our self-sufficiency and surrender to God's sufficiency. As we pray, I don't know what it is you're passing through. But I do know that I am not alone. And some people may be here complaining that their take-home pay doesn't take them home. It's a reality of life. You're hardly meeting your bills, and the bills keep accumulating. And one of the things with living in America is that your bills are not patient like bills in Nigeria. Uh, bills here keep coming whether you work or you don't work. Bills don't understand, hey, can you give me some time off? In the midst of this, I do not promise that your situation will change overnight, but I do promise you that there is a God who sympathizes with you in the midst of your suffering, and He loves you. Sometimes it's a marriage that isn't working the way you thought it would. We find ourselves in that situation where we wonder all of the beautiful promises and hope that the marriage had before now. I mean, it's like you're wondering, when you saw this lady, it was like, God must be the one who gave her to me. When you saw this guy, you felt that way, and now you're wondering, was it really God or the other person? <laughs> In the midst of this, there is a God who understands. And, and as children, children will always wish that they had better parents than the one they have. I, I was in that place. I felt like, how come other people have better fathers than I do, better mothers than I do, until I became a father? Then I discovered that my father was right. <laughs> I want us to take time and pray. Can we have the prayer team to please come forward as we, we just take time and pray and, and hopefully close? Like I said, I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what trials and, and afflictions you're going through. But I assure you that you are not alone. Other believers... Other brothers and sisters the world over are passing through all kinds of sufferings and difficulties and hardship. It might be a health challenge, whether it's you or someone that you love and you have prayed and trusted God and asked for, for, for His divine intervention, and it feels to you like God isn't interested in it. He is. May I request that we rise as we pray.